In this video, I'd like to go over an example for an hypothesis test for a mean, and we are dealing with one sample mean. So it is claimed that the mean salary of college-educated women in Pennsylvania is less than the national average, and that is known to be 45,000. <clears> After doing a simple random sample, we found that our information from our 25 college-educated women that we sampled, we found that their mean salary was 44,200 with a standard deviation of 3,000. We want to test the claim, and if we go back, we know that we want to test whether or not this is less than the national average, right? That's the claim that's being made with a 0.05 level of significance. I've gone ahead and I've underlined some things here in red that are related to our sample. We took a sample of 25 individuals, so I might as well write that down, right? N is equal to 25, that's the size of our sample. The mean salary, this is for our sample, was 44,200. And the sample standard deviation was 3,000. I think it's important to write these things down because we know, especially if we're, we are testing a claim about the mean salary, we know, and the, some of the confusion lies in, is this 44,200 going to be a part of, I, part of our alternative and null hypothesis? And they're not. Okay, so anything with the mean here, the sample mean, these numbers we're not going to see when we write our null hypothesis. This is because these numbers, we are comparing our sample with some claim. And whether or not if that claim is true, what's the probability that we, re we receive these results from our sample, assuming that that null hypothesis is true. That's known as a p-value. So we are going to have a null hypothesis, and we are going to have an alternative hypothesis, and we know we are testing a claim about the mean. So we need to make an, uh, an assumption, an hypothesis, about the population mean. So if you look at this claim up here, the claim is that the mean average salary of college-educated women in Pennsylvania is less than the national average, which is known to be 45000 Right. So we are making a claim that it's less than. So if I wanted to talk about mu being less than, I know that's going to have to go in the alternative hypothesis. And the reason why is because we reserve anything with greater than, less than, or not equal to, that's going to go in the null hypothesis. And the null hypothesis, or excuse me, the alternative hypothesis, and the null hypothesis is going to be just assuming, okay, let's assume that it is true. Now you might see in some books this will be greater than or equal to our book, and what we're going to do is just let's just assume that the claim is true. Nothing has changed. The mean is 45,000. Testing that against the alternative that it's actually less. At this point, it might help if you just go ahead and label. If you label, I'm going to change the color here. If you label that this is our original claim, all right? So this is the original claim. And sometimes a claim will be as the alternative. Sometimes the claim will be listed as the null. But I think if you try to go back and, and you kind of forget where things are, at least here in the beginning, before we even calculate anything, we see that the original claim is held here that the mean is less than 45,000. Okay, so that's just setting the problem up. Now, what is our level of significance? We want to test this with a certain level of significance. That's our alpha level. We are told that the level of significance is 0 0.05. We're going to draw a picture and label the critical value in the rejection region. So we have 0 0.05 as our we have 0 0.05 as our level of significance. What I want to know is this a one-tailed test or two-tailed test? So think about that as I finish drawing the bell curve here. Whether or not our test is going to be, if we're constru constructing this hypothesis test, is it one-tailed or two-tailed? Well, hopefully you said one tail, and in fact, it's a left-tailed test. And the reason why is our null hypothesis is equal to, as it always will, the alternative is a less than. Mean is less than 45,000, less than is a left-tailed test. We need to have a rejection region here to the left. So this is our rejection region, and it's going to have an area of 0.05. So the level of significance is 0.05. That's going to be the area in our rejection region. We want to draw a picture and label the critical value in rejection region. This is the, I'm going to write this as RJ. This is the rejection region. We want to know what is the critical value that separates 
so this is the critical value, CV. We're looking for a critical value that separates the lower 5% from the upper 95%. And we're going to use that critical value then if we have our test statistic, which we'll calculate, does our test statistic lie in this critical, this critical zone or this rejection region, or does it fall a little bit short? So how do we find this critical value? Well, what I'm looking for, I'm looking for a T value, right? I'm looking for a, we're not looking for a Z score. This is the T distribution because we don't know the population standard deviation. So we're looking for a T score of the lower 5%, right? So we're looking for a T score of 0.05 to the left. I'm going to put left in the parentheses here. We're looking for a Z score, I'm sorry, a T score with 0.05 to the left of this T score with how many degrees of freedom? Well, the degrees of freedom is going to be one less than our sample size. So our sample size is 25. Our degrees of freedom will be 24. So if you use your book, the back of the book, we're looking at the T chart, and we know the area, the area in one tail, this is a one tailed test, the area in one tail is 0.05. The area in one tail is 0.05. And we're going to go all the way down to the degrees of freedom for 24. And I got 1.711. 1.711. This is the critical value that separates. It's 1.711. Now keep in mind here, if this is to the left of the mean, this is going to have to be negative. Now I know in your book it's positive, but if you look on the left-hand side of that page, it's going to tell you that if it's a left-tailed test, you're actually going to have the negative critical value. So the critical value is 1.711, but since it's to the left of the mean, we know it's going to be negative 1.711. So this is our critical region, our rejection region. The critical value is 1.711, negative 1.711. And what we know is when we calculate our test statistic, if our test statistic lies within this rejection region, lies within this area of 0.05, then we will reject the null. That's what the rejection region tells us. So let's go back down here and calculate the test statistic. What is the formula for the test statistic for a t-test? This is always good to have your, your formula sheet handy. It's going to be the sample mean, the sample mean minus the mu, which is hypothesized, divided by the sample standard deviation, divided by the square, oops, sorry, the square root of n. This should be n, the letter n. So we have x bar, our sample mean, which if we go back up here, everything in red is associated with our sample. 44,200. Well, I don't know what happened there. 44,200, maybe I'll zoom back in. 44,200 minus the hypothesized mean of 45,000, I automatically know I'm on the right track because I know this number is going to be negative. And my critical value is negative. So if my critical value is negative, my test statistic better be negative too. And that's not always going to happen, but that's going to make the most sense. So 3,000 is our sample standard deviation divided by the square root of the sample size, which is 25. I have no idea why this keeps doing this, but it is definitely annoying. So, I'm going to put that whole thing in the calculator. If you do this step by step, this problem is not going to be bad to do it step by step because we have a nice number of the denominator of the square root of 25. But you should be able to, if you use parentheses, put this whole thing in your calculator. I'll do. So square root of five. Okay. I got <clears throat> negative point five nine six. The reason I'm taking this out three decimal points, we 
Again, the rounding in this particular problem is not going to make much of a difference, but if you look at our critical value, our critical value is rounded or goes out to the thousandths place. Since we are going to be comparing our test statistic to that critical value, we might as well go out to the same decimal value. So we see that by calculating our test statistic that we get negative 0.596. So if I were to draw that, okay, and maybe I'll change the color again to, let's say, green. If I were to draw this test statistic, this is kind of giving us a value. How far are we from the mean? Well, here's negative 1.711. We're at negative 0.596. That's maybe right here. It's less than 1. So here's negative 0.596. Are we in the rejection region? We're not past negative 1.711. If we were at, let's say, negative 1.9 or negative 2 or negative 3, all of those are in this zone, this rejection zone. But we are not. We are here at negative 0.596. We are not in the rejection region. This means, and I'll write this even before we make a conclusion, this is fail to reject. We are not in the rejection region. We are not in the rejection region. So what are we failing to reject? We are failing to reject the null hypothesis. So this is the hypothesis. We, we cannot say there's enough evidence to reject this. So I'm going to put a star next to it. It doesn't mean that we proved this, but there is no evidence to suggest that the population mean is less than 45,000. Okay. So if I were to go back and make a conclusion, I'm going to say this. Because the test statistic is not in the critical or excuse me, is not in the critical zone or the rejection zone. We will fail to reject the null hypothesis. That means that according to this problem, there is evidence to support the claim, not the original claim, but there's evidence to support that there's really no difference between our sample and $45,000. The original claim was the null hypothesis. We are not in favor of that. The null seems to be a much more likelier occurrence than the alternative. So because we are failing to reject, there's no evidence to support this person's claim or whoever made this claim up here. There's no evidence to support that given what we know about this sample. I hope that has made a little bit of sense.